¿Aló? ¿Aló? Buenos días. Sí. Por favor, pasen a sentarse. Ya vamos a dar inicio. Gracias. Me voy a quitar la chamarra. Ya comienzo. Ok, vamos a continuar con la siguiente presentación de James Brown. His work explores making at a variety of skills and techniques, creating projects that strive to redefine the role of design in society. His explorations exhibit curiosity of process and cross fertilization. His career spans the fields of furniture making, public and gallery art, interior architecture, teaching, architecture, construction, and community building. He do not always draw distinct lines between these files. Instead, they complement, inform, and cajole each other as well as ultimately strengthening the design solution. His many years of combined practice are intricately linked with community and the theory of practice of learning. For most of his private practice career, he has taught design and architecture at accredited schools of architecture and design. He has been a faculty member at the new school of architecture and later at Woodbury University from their founding at Liberty Station in 1988. Both of these early appointments were undergraduate level instruction, teaching core six unit design studios. In 2016, he returned to new school as a graduate level studio instructor before beginning his SDSU teaching career in the spring of 2019. Since joining R plus Design, he has been active in leading students to design spaces on campus through the beautiful community and have engaged several SDSU students as injured through my, his architectural firm public. Recibamoslo con fuerte aplauso. Gracias, eh, buenos días. Mi nombre es James Brown. I apologize that I cannot deliver this presentation in Spanish. I'm a little embarrassed that I cannot do that. So please bear with me. Thank you for your attention. Um, before I start to talk about this project, Friendship Park, I want to just uh, talk a little bit about World Design Capital and just add just some, just one or two things. World Design Capital 2024 is an amazing opportunity for you students. Like something like this doesn't come along very often, like offering the best of design between San Diego and Tijuana. You guys can play a role in this. I mean, think big. This is the chance to really jumpstart your careers in a meaningful way. You're going to get a chance. I don't know where it's going to happen, 
but sometime between now and the end of 2024, you are gonna get a chance to show the region what you're capable of. And I want you to jump on that chance. These kind of small moments as a, as, as a student, as young students can define your career. So take this opportunity and really go for it. And I was just talking to um, Yael and Angelica just um, before this started and in some emails. And in fact, the, this university and the university that I teach at, San Diego State, who knows what we can do? Maybe we can like co-teach a class or somehow deepen our relationship across the border. It's time to think of ourselves as part of a region and not just a city. Um, so think about that, think about it deeply and jump on the opportunity when it comes. My practice um, is divided roughly into three parts. I'm an architect. Um, my company is called Public Architecture. I've been an architect for 30 years and have had my own firm for 30 years. I started out as a furniture maker and then gradually got slightly larger and larger projects till the kind of stuff I do most of the time now, I've done all sorts of different projects, but I do dense urban infill, pretty fine grained, mixed use, affordable housing projects in San Diego in, in different communities. That's my current passion, uh, providing affordable housing in a mixed use environment. Um, the second thing that I do is I teach full time at San Diego State. I teach in the School of Art and Design. I've always taught my whole career as an architect, but only part time, like one studio a year. But for the past three, uh, three years, I've been teaching full time there. And it's a commitment that I will keep for quite some time. One of the main reasons I started teaching full time there is because we are we're a public school, right? San Diego State is a public university. We are starting a, an accredited school of architecture at that school. It will be the only public uh, school of architecture that's accredited in our, in our region. Uh, I think the next closest one in the US is like Pomona or something. But interestingly, the great thing about this school, it's gonna become just by virtue of its location, a bi-national school. A ton of students from Baja California are gonna go to this school as well. It's super exciting. Um, and I hope that you guys can participate in some as aspect of that also. Um, the third part of my current practice is uh, I own a community arts building called Bread and Salt. It's in Barrio Logan. It's in Logan Heights. It has five galleries, instructional studio space, um, event space. Uh, people are learning how to do printmaking, learning how to paint, learning how to do sculpture. Uh, we have like uh, we have a brewery there if you want to come there called Mujeres Brewery. It's women owned. It's woman operated. Even the head brewer is a woman. Um, it's a it's an interesting project. I'm really excited about that project. And the last phase of that project, we've, we've been doing this project for 13 years now, quite a while. The, the building and the communi uh, community arts building is sort of stabilized. But the last piece of the puzzle is a artist uh, live work residential project that I'm gonna design and develop. It'll have 40 units, all for artists, um, kind of characterized by really small living spaces, uh, like 200, 250 square feet. And then a door leading to a double height, like 18 foot tall uh, workspace, full of light, full of windows. So that's the last piece of the puzzle. So those are my three areas of interest as a professional right, right now, but I want to talk to you about something else. I want to talk to you about Friendship Park. This is a project that I've been involved with since 2008. In 2008, I was selected uh, to do a mid-career fellowship at Harvard, at the GSD at Harvard. And when you go there, they tell you, you don't have to do any project. You can just go and like kind of soak it in, I suppose. But I, I'm not really wired that way. I like to do projects. So I decided that I wanted to investigate what it would be like to do a binational design a binational city on the border between San Diego and Tijuana. And I just randomly chose as my site Friendship Park. Uh, this site right here. So Friendship Park lies at the intersection of Playas and Tijuana. Of course, you're going to recognize the you're going to recognize the bull ring. And then uh, Borderfield State Park, which is an open estuary that's 
the largest estuary in Southern California. It's a huge open space. I didn't know anything about the current use there, um, the, the, the important meeting place and what it stands for for the families that, that meet there. I just knew it was a sort of a stimulating intellectual exercise for an architect. So I studied that project and did kind of an artistic study of it for a year in Cambridge. And when I came back to San Diego, I presented it at the Contemporary Museum. I displayed all the work at the museum in town. And I was approached after the opening by this group of four people. And they said, we see your exhibit and we want you to help us on friendship, a friendship park project. And I said, what, what friendship park project? I didn't know anything about what friendship park really was. I just treated it like just an intellectual exercise, like I was a robot. I really didn't know anything about it. And they go on to tell me um, that in the year that you were gone, 2008 to 2009, Homeland Security had built a second fence. Before 2008, there was just the one primary fence. And people would meet up against the fence here on the, on the beach and near the monument to like see family members informally and just sit down, lay a blanket on the ground and spend time with family members through the fence. And this is a really important thing to keep in mind. And I, I know you're familiar with it, but it bears repeating. You wonder in this age of like, we all carry our lives with us right here, right? You can call people, you can, you can, you can like have video conferencing, you can do anything. So why would you need to go to a place and see someone face to face? It's not that important, but there are some things in life that are more and so important that a video conference call or a telephone call just won't cut it. For example, what if you thought you were seeing your parents for the last time? What if that you thought this was gonna be the last time you see your parents? It would not cut it to call them. It would not cut it to do a video chat. You would wanna go there in person. And people make the amazing effort of traveling, not hundreds, but thousands of miles to go to this meeting place. That's how important it is. Or what if you're seeing your grandkids for the first time? You would do it again. You would do that same thing. So in 2008, nine, Homeland Security built the second fence and that was 100 feet north of the primary. And they didn't know about the park. They cut off access. So this group approached me at the opening and said, would you help us reopen Friendship Park for meeting places? And I said I would help. I'm used to talking to groups. I can do diagrams. I can negotiate with Border Patrol. I'll try. So we, we <laughs> I better start looking at other slides here. We'll be stuck here all day. Sorry. So. We started negotiating and I was, I, we managed to make a tolerable situation. Look how, look how intolerable that image is. It's probably the most uh, uh, aesthetically non-pleasing, um, hostile, um, um, security laden meeting place in the world. And yet it's a very, very important place to protect. And I find myself as a designer torn because I don't wanna, I don't wanna tell people that this is good, but the function, the, the necessary function overrides how ugly it is. So we've been working for all those years to make it slightly more tolerable. This is, this, these are all the organizations that Homeland Security like basically overrode all the regulations and rules that the US has so they could do what they want on the border. Dozens, hundreds of organizations and laws in the US were just like bypassed just so they could build this wall. So we, we negotiated in good faith. We slowly over time built up the number of people that could visit this park at any given time, up to 50 at a time, two days a week. Uh, we, we were able to negotiate um, them building a rolling gate in the northernmost wall to make it slightly more tolerable. So if they had big events in there, like they do sometimes, um, like hundreds of people, they could open one side and make it slightly less obtrusive, slightly less militarized. But this is what, this is the reality of it. There's a mesh, a really tight mesh. All you can do 
is touch fingertips. That's all you can do, barely touch fingertips. And you can't, in such a tight mesh, you really can't see people properly. You can only like see one eye at a time. So you can't make out people's faces very well. You can move over to the side, like 100 yards to the side where you're able to stand back farther and see people more clearly. But then you have the problem that you can't talk intimately with people. And really, when you're visiting someone in that, that space, you, wanna, you don't want to yell. You want to talk very quietly. You want to talk about personal things. And it's, a, it's both a incredibly moving and very heartbreaking. You may have heard in the news just recently that um, Border Patrol was going to completely destroy Friendship Park, even worse than it already had, by completing the 30-foot wall segments that you've seen all along the border. So when, when Trump was president, he allowed Homeland Security and encouraged Homeland Security to, to basically militarize the entire border between the US and Mexico, building 30-foot tall fences everywhere. Luckily, when Biden was elected, Biden put a, an immediate halt to all new construction on the border. And that meant that that had stopped the 30 foot tall walls within sight of Friendship Park, just on the next hill. But he did manage to stop it. So we breathed a sigh of relief. But then about three months ago, um, myself and a couple other people that kind of watch over Friendship Park were called into the Border Patrol headquarters and informed they were going to complete the 30 foot tall walls. And we asked, how can you do that? You're not, you're, you're not allowed to. There's a law against new wall construction. But they found a loophole, of course. The loophole was, well, the, 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 the walls are falling down. The, the, the rust is forming and falling on people. It might cause injuries. So under the guise of maintenance, they decided that they could just complete the effort. We mobilized all our elected officials on both sides of the border and put a stop to that, a temporary halt to the construction. And then I led a design team of design professionals on both sides of the border again to point out to Border Patrol that this was not the proper course of action and to just leave it how it was, even though the current condition is not great, to leave it how it was. Well, we just found out a week ago that they rejected our, our pleas and they started construction on it, I think yesterday. So. Friendship Park is going to be covered over. But there's, an, there's another vision, um, a vision that kind of harkens back to the work I did when I was at Harvard for that year, and that's a binational park. International Friendship Park was actually christened by our first lady, Pat Nixon, in 1971. Um, she, uh, at the time, the border was just separated by a single strand of barbed wire. If you can believe, it's hard to believe now, but in 1971, that's all there was. So she came to the park and she had instructed her secret service agents to cut the barbed wire. And she walked into Mexico, shaking hands with people and saying, I hope there's not a wall here too much longer. It's hard to believe that was a Republican, Republicans president's wife saying that. So things have changed drastically in the United States. We're much more, our government is very conservative now. The current design, the current plan then, is for a different kind of park. Imagine an 80-acre binational park on that site. 40 acres in Sandy in uh, in Playas, and 40 acres at Monument Mesa. 40 acres is so big it encompasses all of the bull, the old bull ring, all sorts of businesses on the boardwalk. It's an immense piece of land. And we're not proposing to change any ownerships. The proposal does not include tearing anything down and making parks. All of those ownerships stay the same. And it's a very complex ownership in Playas. It's local, it's municipal, it's federal, it's state. All of those things stay. People still live there. People still have businesses there. There's still restaurants. Everything goes on, but the fence is gone. The fence would be removed for this 80 acre by National Park. Instead, it would be, there would be an underground uh, system built where in case of a national emergency of some kind, you could raise it, but 24 hours a day, it would not be raised. 
And on the north side, on the estuary side, I, I, the, the idea is very nice because the average Tijuana citizen can walk fully over the border and onto the edge of this vast estuary, which is quite a beautiful resource. But it's not just going to be a, an estuary there. The vitality of the boardwalk at Playa, some, probably a lot of you have been there, I'm sure, will be continued north across the border, full of businesses, restaurants, um, offices. Imagine a pier on the border jutting out into the ocean 1,800 feet, and not just like a fishing pier, a pier so big that you could have ho hotels on it, parks of themselves, maybe even places for boats to come up to, a place of celebration. There will be no need for a fence on the northernmost boundary of this binational park because uh, Homeland Security has become really, really good at passive surveillance. So it's just going to be open to the estuary. The estuary is quite large, easy to watch. It will become a pedestrian only border crossing. That takes an act of Congress of both Mexico and the United States. This is not an easy project to do. This is a project that I think will be done in my lifetime. I believe in this project. What we need is a symbol of the ordinary friendship between the citizens of Mexico and the citizens of the US. We're starting, I'm afraid, the average citizen has not been swayed yet, but we're nearing that tipping point where the average citizen is starting to dis distrust the average citizen from the other side. And that's something that we cannot allow to happen. Together, like imagine the powerhouse countries of Mexico, the United States and Canada forming like the closest bonds of anywhere on the earth. There's nothing that we can't accomplish together as one force. This is why I feel this project is so important. The best security that we can have is cooperation and friendship and trust. And a project like this one would be a reminder to the rep to both countries that this kind of thing is possible, and also a reminder to the entire world that this is possible. So we've been we've been holding design competitions with other professionals. Uh, we'll be working on this project for the next all the way through 2024, and you know who knows maybe some of you want to participate in some of this work. We'll be exhibiting the entire um, design for this project at the Contemporary Museum of San Diego in 2024 as well. And um, I invite any questions from you guys. Thanks for your attention. Uh, hi, very nice to meet you. Um, first of all, I want to say congratulations because that's honestly an outstanding piece of work. And I can see that there's a lot of effort for so many people on this project, right? So my first question, uh, actually I have two, but my first question is what inspired you from like citizens of the U.S. to like do something about about the border because um it's gonna sound a little rude but i don't think many people understand really the problems that we as the border country deal with and i'm just curious about what inspired you to like put a focus on something that's been going on for so many years oh, thank thank you for the questions there, you know, there's a lot of people, more than you would suspect, in the U.S. that are passionate about this idea. The idea of that we are already a region. You know, we are a region already. We're a really unusual region. There's not many couplet cities like Tijuana, San Diego, in the world that have the latent power that we have. It's almost limitless. Like together, if we're if we're not in opposition so much. If we're like sharing ideals, and I already see it, 
Well, through Bread and Salt, the arts organization, organization that I've been running for 13 years, artists have been communicating and cooperating for many years already. And you know, artists are usually like the first, the vanguard to, 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 to begin new thinking and to push a new way of believing and can lead to cultural change. So these things, they're already happening. Um, it's just the general population, I think, needs to push. I first, the, the, the idea of, of the binational park, I think it came to me because a friend of mine was telling me about this bridge over the Rio Grande. And of course, there was a, it, was a, it was a pedestrian and car bridge. And I hadn't been to this bridge, but my friend was saying, yeah, you, if you're in the US, you, you walk across the bridge and then the checkpoint to go into Mexico, the Mexican customs checkpoint is like a hundred yards into Mexico. And then he said, and on the same bridge, like if, if you're gonna go to the US, you, you cross the bridge and the checkpoint to the US is like a hundred yards into the US. So people are on this bridge together and they haven't, they haven't no, one's checked them, no one's checked them in or out of anything. They're like, they're on a binational space automatically. And I thought, well, that is the weirdest thing I've ever heard of. Really? Is that true? And, and that kind of led me to thinking about this binational space in more, in more detail. Is that one small, teeny little example? Another one is that, oh, I forget the acronym now, like, like the walking bridge to the Tijuana airport is another example. I don't think it's everything it needs to be. When they were talking about it in theoretical terms, they were talking about all sorts of meeting rooms, you know, on the bridge and people getting together, um, talking about big ideas between our two countries. I don't think that's happening, but it has the same potential. These kind of built in structures are already slowly happening all over the place, right in front of our eyes, but we don't recognize it yet. So if we can use that as examples to show people and to show the world, then we can do these things on a much larger scale. Thank you very much. That's so inspiring. Um, hi, first and foremost, thank you for all the information you're sharing with us. It, as she said, it's truly inspiring. And what I'm asking might sound like a bit of a killjoy because of all the inspiration and hope you have shared with us, but I can't help but worry. And I ask, do you worry about the possible gentrification that might happen once this is built? Because you mentioned offices and hotels. And although I understand the sentiment, I can't help but worry because Playas is such a gentrified piece of land because many Americans are coming over to live there. So this is going to be a binational area and it's be gonna become something greater than both uh, nations. It becomes a region in and of itself, but it might become something that is not attainable for the people who might need it, which in this case are maybe low income people who are um, immigrants. So I ask, do you have any plan regarding that? How can you help prevent that from happening because it's such a lucrative space? That's an excellent question. And I, I can't say that I have an answer to that question, but I, we've, you're already seeing that in Tijuana. There's been several articles written about the, the, how apartment prices are going up and in part because people are coming to live down here from San Diego. I've been reading that in the news. Gentrification is also a huge problem just in San Diego in general, and I'm sure in Tijuana in all cities of the world. I don't know the answer to it, but I know the strategy in San Diego, I'm more famili familiar with that, is to put as many housing units on the market as is humanly possible. The reason that housing has skyrocketed, and I don't know this, I apologize for not researching the Tijuana example as much, but the reason that housing has skyrocketed in San Diego is because there's been a vacancy rate below 5% in San Diego for over 35 years. There just has not been enough housing and our city leaders throughout California have been super slow to allow a, the ability of homeowners to build secondary units and so forth. So much so that finally 
our leaders in Sacramento, you know, our state leaders had to step in and tell, like, they have this group in San Diego called, well, in the United States called NIMBYs. Have you heard NIMBYs? Not in my backyard. Like, yeah, everyone's in favor of, uh, of, of putting out more housing and improving uh, the ability of people to afford housing until it's next door to them. Then they say, no, I don't want it. So that's why all these small communities like San Diego and LA, well, not so small, have been saying no to development. But Sacramento jumped over all of them and just said, no, we're just giving people the permission to create housing. So just in the last like three years in San Diego, you, we have the ability to put granny flats, second units on every single family property in the state of California. It's gonna make a huge, big difference. It's gonna take at least 10 years, at least 10 years to make up for what we've already lost. The other thing that Sacramento did, and this is gonna make California's insanely pissed off when they finally figure out what the rule is, but every single single family lot in the state of California, the homeowners are, uh, are allowed by right to subdivide it into two lots and the cities cannot say no. So what that really means, it's gonna change the fabric of our suburbs and I'm all for it. I want it to change the fabrics of our suburbs. I don't wanna, I don't wanna continually build out into the, into the rural areas and decimate all the open space. What it means is that for every single family lot you have in, in California, you can cut it in half, so you already have two, right? Oh, but there's more. The granny flat ordinance on top of that allows you to each of those two to have a granny flat and a junior granny flat. So what was one house will be six. People are gonna be so pissed off <laughs> when they figure this out, but you know what? It's an emergency. I don't know if you've ever been to Los Angeles and seen the home, seen the homeless situation there, or San Diego. It's it's unbelievable. It's it's and I'm and, and there's no difference here and here too. We have got to do something to make housing affordable for our citizens. And I still don't have an answer to your question. I apologize. I don't know if it's answerable because we do have this built-in. Just like there's a big disparity between citizens of San, within San Diego, between the rich and the poor in San Diego, there's a big disparity built in between citizens of the U.S. and citizens of Mexico. So that compounds the problem. Uh, and I, I don't have a solution. I'm not that smart. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it's okay. Thanks for your honesty and thanks for the information, really. <laughs> Uh, thanks, you guys. I appreciate your attention. You have a good voice. You have a good voice. <laughs> I don't, no, I don't need it. It's more of a good question, to be honest. Uh, I wanted to ask about the name of the school that we're looking at. Oh. And something that is more about it. I, I wanted to know. The, the school I work at? Oh, yeah, San Diego State University. Yeah, it's in San Diego. It's a, it's a, it's part of a big infrastructure of universities in the, the state of California, and uh, I teach in the School of Art and Design. So in that school, they have uh, interior architecture, they have graphic design, they have metalworking, woodworking, ceramics, jewelry making. All it's a really beautiful hands-on school. And what I'm coming to learn about this school is you guys do a lot of that. You have that, a lot of that same ethic and that same concentration, which I'm, I was really excited to learn that because I didn't know much about the inner workings of the school. The thing that you guys are doing that's very exciting because I was talking to Angelica about it is that you're combining all of these fields in your field of study under the heading of design. We don't do that at San Diego State, and I want to do that definitely want to change San Diego State for the better by not just being in a silo of just ceramics or for our jewelry making or woodworking, but combine all of those beautiful activities into, into one kind of interdisciplinary field. That's something we've been talking about at San Diego State, and to know there's already a model here is pretty inspiring. Did I answer your question? Okay. Okay. 
Hello, my name is Lilith. Nice to meet you. Um, as you know, there's a lot of movement between the city of San Diego and Tijuana, like every day. We're even, we, we even fused for the war design capital. My question is, why is there so much like opposition from the state of California, from Homeland Security, Border Patrol to build the park? What is the reason? I don't think there's opposition. This is this this well. There's opposition on the the government level. Why? Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I know that it's good for the health of both our countries if we're going to have a symbol of our friendship instead of this continuing symbol of opposition and hostility. And it's not too late. You know, I can see it. I can still see the the general willingness of normal people like us to want to communicate with each other and share. But if all people do is listen to the news and some of these like far flung, well, that's because we live here and we know, but in other places in the US when they can't see it with their own eyes, they distrust it. And they, they're listening to certain news channels every night and getting the wrong information, uh, twisted information. And they start to somehow believe there's danger when there really is not danger. And also a lot of people think of this proposal as someone saying, I think we should tear down all the walls and have open immigration. When actually this proposal is not saying that. This proposal is neutral on that idea. This proposal is just is, is saying, let's build a symbol of our friendship in a binational space. Both countries still retain their sovereign lands. We're not getting rid of that. It's, it's, a, it's a way just to prove that there is communion, cooperation, trust, friendship between our countries. I think it will be a very popular idea. If for instance, your president and our president were to talk, get together and talk about it even once, maybe they have. I, I think they would both be really want to do this project, but they have a lot of other forces on all sides that want to, want to like whisper in their ear and tell them maybe it might cause some problems for them if they were to say that out loud. I know our president would want to do this. Of course, we know that. But he's, he's handcuffed because if he were to publicly support it, there's a decent chance that someone like Donald Trump would be reelected. So these, these politicians are overly timid, in my opinion. I think, I think they do better to be stronger and just state the truth and state what they really believe more often than they do now. But I do think this idea would be embraced by the majority of people in both countries. If, if you know, no one's talking about it really, just we know about it here. Probably a lot of you might not have known about it before this morning. Who, is there anyone that, that didn't know about Friendship Park before this talk? A lot, oh, like probably half of you did not know much about it, yeah, yeah. I think education and, and spreading the word is, is the best thing that, that we could do to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, is it working? Okay. Um, I, I don't have a question, but I just want to personally thank you for talking about this topic in particular, given that this park has influenced me a lot in, in many ways possible, if anything. Um, I've been there a few times and it's, so, it's very heartwarming to see so, so many families being, being together again, even though they're just separated by this one tiny wall, right? But even then, it, that's, like, that's a small fragment of happiness and I really appreciate that. So thank you very much. Oh. Thank you very much for your statements. Thanks for your sentiment. Appreciate that. Um, hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, taking into account everything you have seen and lived and the stuff you just discovered that is about to happen, like, you just mentioned that the objective isn't, like, destroying the walls, but, like, do you feel that the objective about um, finding a better way to help people um, interact 
do you think the adjective that you're fighting for could be rich soon or like will be like just a long could could you ask that could you ask that question one more time i had a sure. hard time hearing um okay so you have said that there's been a lot of fight to not destroy the wall but to make the interaction between those two uh people that want to interact you have said that it's difficult but you you said that you don't want to destroy the wall just find a way to make it easier do you think it's going to be uh like you're going to accomplish it or do you have a lot of more fight to do with everything you have seen and know that it's about to happen or oh, are you asking what i think the likelihood and what the path to success of this project is yeah oh okay sorry it took me so long to figure <laughs> well <clears throat> i think we've made significant gains in the last year and unfortunately most of those gains are due to the the hostile actions of homeland security in 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 closing friendship park has been closed for since the pandemic started homeland security closed friendship park when trump was president and they haven't opened it yet and they have a lot of reasons why what i'm learning is that border patrol really would love to keep that park closed forever for them it's just a headache you know they're not really made to be park rangers they're made to be agents of enforcement they don't know how to like stand back and let people meet and they don't want to do that either they don't want any part of that but the good thing about their opposition lately has been that it's gotten us a lot of support from local politicians Virtually every politician in the region has written the letter of support for Friendship Park. Now you could argue that it didn't it didn't matter, right? Because we're losing. They're they're building all the tall walls anyway. And the you know the the sad thing about those tall walls, they say in meetings we have to build the tall walls because we have statistics that show that people are throwing chunks of concrete over the low walls and injuring agents, which is total BS. We asked them to prove it, to give us data. They could not give us a single instance, not one. However, on the other hand, we have tons of data that show if you have a 30 foot tall wall, there's people falling off of those and ending up in the emergency rooms all over the Southern United States. We have tons of real data showing all the injuries and deaths that occur from people falling off those tall walls. So their, arg their, their argument is like the opposite of what's happening. But I think the more they push and push false data at us, and the more we just try and stay calm and tell the truth, more, more and more people will listen. And eventually, ho hopefully the word will get through that co -op a symbol of cooperation is the best security that our countries can have. Thank you. Well, again, I think, is that it? Oh. Hi, so first of all, even though a lot of us has, have already said it, thank you so much for the information on this amazing project. I think it's an outstanding uh, effort to bring together two people that live in this region. And it's just, wow, it's really wonderful. So thank you. And um, my first question would be, how could any of us take part in this or support it in any way, either indirectly or directly? Like, is there something we can do about it? I, I, I know there is. I will. There, I will put you in touch with the the group of us that are that are working in this realm. I'll okay. I'll send my you know my contact number to Yael and she can spread it to all you students. I'm fine with that. And um, and I think there's something that you can help with, like in the coming year. Like we'll be we'll be fleshing out this project between now and the end of 2024. So that's that's a couple. That's like two years, right? Almost two years. There's a lot of work to do. It would be really cool to have like a binational effort, like with students here and with students at San Diego State, 
I mean, that sounds really appealing to me. So to somehow, I don't want to piss people off, like, but like the administration, but I imagine like a teach, a teaching a co-class between our universities or something like that with like with the border as the as the topic or something. I don't know. We can think of something, but and that's why I kind of mentioned that at the beginning about world design capital. This is an incredible opportunity for institutions like universities to forge new partnerships that won't just last one year. That's not the idea. It's not just to celebrate in 2024 and be done with it. It's to create something lasting that we can like celebrate for decades to come or for forever, strengthening our ties through education, corporations, design firms. It's the sky's the limit. I mean, we can be so much stronger together than apart. And I think this is our time to really forge those uh, connections and um, let's, let's do it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. That's uh, it's it's really exciting to to hear about this. And just to move on, uh, my second question would be: I know you said you this. Sorry, I know you said this is your life's work, but at the same time, I'd like to ask, or I don't know if you thought about, like, what would be the next step? I know, like, this was the biggest opportunity. I think uh, just because of the importance of the border between. Tijuana and San Diego, like it's it's the most crossed border just internationally, worldwide. But what do you think would be a next a good next step into joining, uh, like, the borders between San, sorry, between the U.S. and Mexico? I, I think we're we're taking it right now. When this when this and this will not be like a. This design will not be like a set of blueprints. It's a, going to be a visionary plan, a visionary document that if enacted next year or 10 years from now or 20 years from now, then there'll be a whole process of design. A project like this is billions of dollars of cost, not, not millions, billions, and many, many, many years of effort putting all the pieces of the puzzle together and planning all the the buildings, infrastructure, and everything. It's a gigantic project. I don't want any part of that. That's, that's not my role. Our role or my role is just to like imagine it and get people interested in it. And I think so the next step is preparing those drawings and documents and models, displaying them in 2024. And if we're lucky and we're good, we'll, the public will grab a hold of it and push it the rest of the way. It's gonna take the public and our government to, and both our governments to make it happen. It's a complicated process, but, and it's a big dream, right? But it's a good dream. It's a beautiful dream. And I think it will happen. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, thanks you guys again. Thank you so much. It was an honor to be here. I'm deeply regretful that I cannot deliver this in Spanish. I'll try to I'll try it again in a year and a half and see if I could manage it. <laughs> Thank you. Universidad Xochicalco Campus Tijuana Certificate of Participation is presented to James Brown in recognition of valuable participation at the 13th Design Week as a speaker. Cooperation and trust as an alternative to walks, the battle for Friendship Park for members of the design faculty and students.